Well, I was, I was born and raised in Texas. Uh, didn't, in fact, uh, I, I lived in Texas until I moved here to Washington, D.C., a, a place that I said I would never live in. Uh, but the p opportunity came for me to move into this position. But when I uh, was raised there, I have uh, seven brothers and sisters. Uh, we were raised on a cotton farm. My father was a cotton sharecropper in Texas, and that meant that uh, he worked for $30 a week plus 15 acres of cotton. And at the end of the year, when we picked the cotton, that was the uh, additional dollars that he earned. During the summertime as a child, uh, and I started at the age of 10, uh, I was out in the fields working 10 hours a day, five days a week, uh, weeding cotton. They, they call it hoeing cotton in, in West Texas. Uh, and that was how we made our summer money. There was no uh, sacking groceries or, or working at McDonald's. And when you live on a cotton farm, you work on the, on the cotton farm. And so that's what I did for about nine summers of my life until I was about 19 years of age. I started out at 30 cents an hour because I was a child. The grown-ups were getting 50 cents an hour. And the last year that I worked in the cotton fields, I was about 20 years old. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I was up to about $1.25 an hour. Uh, and, uh, and everyone had to work in the fields. I mean, as the kids were growing up, I think I was probably the youngest. My brother didn't start working till he was 12, and uh, my sister didn't start working till she was 12. Uh, for some reason, I started working at 10. Um, I acted a lot more grown up. I was a pushy little kid, too. Uh, but uh, I started acting a little bit more grown up than the other kids, and so I started working at that age. So it was, uh, it was a good life. It was a very poor life. Uh, we didn't have enough money to go around. We had two pairs of shoes, uh, black for the wintertime and white for the summertime. And you had to make them last. Uh, the same thing um, was for school, even though I was in school up to my freshman year. Uh, same thing, black shoes for winter, white shoes for summer. And you had to make them last, because that's about all you could afford to buy for seven kids at home that were raised by my parents. In 1995, when John Sweeney was putting a slate together to run for the offices of the AFL-CIO, he very deliberately made a decision, and that was that he wanted to create a new position, the new position of executive vice president, but that that position had to be either a woman or a person of color. Uh, well, I qualified on both points. I was a woman and I was a Latina, and I had uh, some prominence in my own union, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. And so they asked if I would run for the position. It had not been created. Uh, it was created at the convention, and I was elected to the position. The position was created to make the labor movement look like the people we represent. Very important to us is the issue of diversity in the American labor movement, about bringing more women into the labor movement leadership, about bringing more people of color, making sure that at every level, at every department, we have Latinos, Asian Americans, African Americans, women, uh, gay, lesbian, transgendered people, that we open the doors of the American labor movement and that we begin to change within ourselves. Uh, there was a running joke that the labor movement was male, pale, and stale uh, because it was mostly older men and they weren't making much inroads in bringing people who looked like me. So 10 years ago, we made this change. Since that time, we have deliberately gone out and had conferences and built diversity into leadership positions. And for our 2009 convention of the AFL-CIO, we are looking to have a 50-50 convention. 50% 50 women, 50% men. And that we have delegates to that convention by however many, many uh, delegates you, you represent in your union and have them be diverse. Uh, not just have men and women, but also if you represent a large segment of the African American community, make sure that that community is represented in your delegate uh, delegation. So we've tried to make that change within ourselves, but we also say the same thing for any movement, that you have to bring the people to the table. Why should we want people in our unions if we're not willing to put them at the table and so that they can take part in what this labor movement offers them and their community? 
Uh, so one, of, one of, part of my job as the executive vice president is to make sure that we build coalitions and partnerships with community organizations, with immigrant advocacy groups, with the religious community, with civil, human, women's rights uh, uh, organizations, so that we build on those things that we can all agree on. Uh, sometimes we don't agree on some issues, uh, or we may come at, a, at an issue by a different method. But for the most part, we're all out there representing the interest of people who sometimes don't have a voice, people who sometimes uh, are treated differently. And so the American labor movement wants to be counted as one of those that stands up and fights uh, for workers, fights for uh, the disenfranchised. Uh, Katrina was a good example. We're going to be spending a lot of union pension dollars in rebuilding in Louisiana but we are concentrating in how we can help the low-income community build homes and try to uh, rebuild in, in Louisiana, uh, but not rebuild condominiums and, and apartment houses that they can't live in. So we, uh, we try to do that, and we try to do it as, as openly and fairly as we can and spend our dollars and spend our time in trying to make tomorrow a, a better life for uh, all workers. It's about 100 degrees. It's a dry heat, but you're looking at 10 hours of sun beating down on you all day long. Uh, we at least had the opportunity to live in a home and not a shack. Uh, we ha were able to take our lunch to, to work, and sometimes if we were close enough to the house, we could go to the house and take a, about a 15, 20 minute nap and then go back to work. So we'd start out at seven o'clock in the morning and work till 6 p.m. Uh, I was fortunate, despite the fact that I felt at the time as a child that I wanted to spend my summers doing anything but working, uh, I at least had a, a, a decent upbringing by my parents. But I saw some things as a child which I think made an impression on me because I saw, for instance, we've been talking just of late about the immigration problem, about the guest worker program that the, uh, that, uh, the Sensenbrenner bill uh, is advocating here in this country. I was young enough to have seen the Bracero program in the cotton farms where my father worked. I saw the living conditions of these workers. I saw the way they were treated. I saw that it was not just a violation of human rights, but a total abuse of worker rights. And I was a very young child. I didn't know what it meant. I just knew that I felt very sorry for them. Uh, we also had migrant workers that came from the Valley of Texas, came to West Texas where I lived and worked in the cotton farms. And then they moved on up through the various states doing other kind of field work ended up sometimes in Minnesota or Wisconsin or Michigan uh, to do uh, agricultural work there. And then about uh, November, close to November, they packed it up and went back home. So I saw the way these children were treated. And given the circumstances, we were local kids, so we got an education. We went to school in early September and we got out in late May and then we went to work on, in the cotton fields. The migrant children had to work all summer. They literally worked right up through October, November. And so they actually missed two months of school every year. So they never really got what you would call a very good education. The Braceros had a, a cuenta, they call it una cuenta en la tienda. Uh, a, uh, they could charge food uh, at the little corner grocery store out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, they had a shack with aluminum siding and an aluminum roof, uh, which didn't do anything for you in the hot sun, and especially in a hot evening. And time and time again, we, I saw these conditions, and I saw also the kind of conditions that my father worked under. As a cotton sharecropper, uh, he had to work from dawn to dusk. He was out there before the sun was up, and he was out there till the, when the sun went down. And he worked anywhere from 60 to 70 hour work weeks, and during the, uh, uh, watering uh, time for the cotton, uh, he would come home at night and, and take a nap and then get up again to change the, the, the water. And then he would go back to sleep and then get up in the middle of the night at two o'clock in the morning to go change the water. And that was his life for a certain period of time. 
it took a lot out of him. I mean, uh, my father was literally, could not work in the cotton fields anymore after the age of 50. And he was, I mean, at 50, I think of it as, as a young man, but he couldn't do the work anymore. So the cotton work just kind of beat him, down, beat him down, beat him out. He couldn't do it anymore. But I saw some of the living conditions. I saw some of the, uh, the, way, the ways that, that these workers were exploited and mistreated. And that's why today we fight such a hard battle to make sure that this doesn't happen again in our country when we're talking about bringing guest workers over here. Uh, it's almost like indentured servitude. And that is one of the issues that we fight against the hardest is that no worker should have to give up their dignity and pride and uh, their very well-being and, 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 and have to work under conditions that I saw many, many years ago. I didn't have the, the good fortune of finishing my education. Uh, I went through the freshman grade. Uh, my father, at the time, could only afford to send four kids to school. That's all he could afford to do. At the age of 15, my father made me drop out of high school so that my younger brother, uh, the youngest of the family at the time that was eligible to go to school, could enter. And so my two brothers, uh, my three brothers and my sister were in school and I couldn't go to school. I cried for two weeks. I was absolutely heartbroken because I wanted to continue my education and could not. Back in those days, the, uh, la cultura, the, uh, the culture of, uh, of our family was that girls didn't need an education because they were gonna get married and, and have babies anyway. So uh, it, was, uh, it was just the way it was. I wanted to learn more. I tried to learn more. My, uh, my brothers and sisters would bring books home from school and I would pore over them, I would read them, I would try to figure out, I would do, look at how they did their homework and I would, I would learn as much as I could. I taught myself how to read uh, Spanish and uh, of course we all spoke Spanish because my parents spoke Spanish, my grandparents spoke Spanish, so we were bilingual and so I learned how to write it and read it. Uh, so I, I self-taught myself uh, at home. But I also saw more about work life. I saw my father humiliated uh, one time when we were, uh, he took me out with him when he was watering the, the cotton and the boss man comes, comes up. And, and uh, so I'm, you know, put in the truck. My dad said, get in the pickup. I got in the pickup and I'm watching. I don't know what it was that my, my father did or I don't know what it was that he didn't do, it was something. Uh, so the boss man comes up and he starts to just literally, literally tear into my dad, just uh, insulting him, yelling at him. And uh, you have this little 11, 12 year old in, in the pickup and who has absolutely no idea why anybody would be doing this to her daddy. Uh, I mean, we're talking about my dad was the, the biggest man in my life at the time and I couldn't believe it. It was almost as if, as if he was shrinking. Uh, in front of me because he, he wasn't defending himself, he was just taking it and when the guy left, my dad got in the pickup and we drove away and he never explained to me what was going on. He never told me, he never explained, I never asked, uh, but I saw how humiliated and embarrassed he was too much to try to explain that. Some of those conditions exist today. Some of those conditions exist where workers are treated less than human, where they are exploited, where they are abused, their rights are denied. And we're not talking about just civil rights or workers' rights. We're in talking about many cases, human rights are denied to these workers. If someone doesn't do something about it, if somebody doesn't feel the passion, if somebody doesn't want to write out and, and change this, shame on them. Uh, maybe I as just only one person of many who tries to make good things happen for workers uh, can multiply that by convincing others that we have to give it a try. We have to make things happen here that do right by workers, that do right by workers who want to do nothing more than provide for their families, a, a better living, a, a college education for their kids, a home, a better car, uh, a job that gives them health insurance or a job that gives them vacation time to be able to spend with their family or, uh, or anything that benefits a worker. And when I saw my father, I knew something was wrong. I knew something 
uh, was terribly wrong that anybody could do that to my father. And I'm, I say to myself on many occasions, if I can prevent one child from having to see or to know that her father or mother is treated in such a manner, then, then I've been successful, then I've done something, then I have accomplished something. But if we don't care enough to try to make those changes, then shame on us as labor leaders, shame on us as any kind of leaders in this country if we don't want to change the things that are happening today, and they're happening today in America. And unfortunately, they're happening to all workers who are denied a voice on the job, workers who are threatened because they want to try to unionize, because they want to have a voice on the job. But even worse is that second tier uh, worker, the second class worker who is not allowed to get citizenship because they are undocumented, uh, that second tier worker who oftentimes uh, is afraid even when they get injured on the job. Undocumented workers don't report injuries. Uh, they don't report when they have to operate hazardous equipment or hazardous materials because it's a job and because they're afraid because they have no rights. So we are trying to make changes as, as, as a leader in the American labor movement. It is our obligation, it is our responsibility to make the changes that help workers. And it isn't just about helping U.S. workers, it's about helping all workers. Because if one worker gets put down, then there's another worker that gets put down right along with them. So if we don't protect those that need protection, what kind of protection is there going to be even for those of us that have union contracts and have good benefits and good health insurance plans? They're already trying to take those away. So uh, we have to keep the fight up. We have to do something. And I'm only one person, but uh, we've managed to recruit quite a few that feel the same way. I think most of the challenges that I faced were very, very early on in my career. Not so much now, because once you reach the level where I am, doors open, recognition is there that I've reached one of the three highest positions in the American labor movement. The first uh, woman of color, the first Latina having reached that level. Uh, you don't get treated badly. You, you, you have a certain place in your community. At the very beginning, however, it was a, a totally different picture. There were not that many women, and much less Latina women, because our culture, the Latino culture, doesn't necessarily put a woman back in the years. Uh, I'm, I'm closing in on 62 years of age. So when I started in the labor movement, it was about, I was about 25. And not too many 25-year-olds were allowed to step into a man's job. And many a time, I was told that. You've got a man's job. You're doing a man's job. You're going into meetings with men. And it's almost like that is the most disgraceful thing you can possibly do. So I had to face that within my own culture. But I had to face it sometimes within my own union brotherhood because they didn't take me seriously. Uh, they sometimes didn't listen to what I had to say. And every time I had a great idea, it wasn't a great idea, it was a nah idea, because it came from me. And yet when we implemented it, when they finally were convinced that it was probably the best way to go, it turned out to be a terrific idea. But because it came from me, it was, uh, well, you know, it, what the hell, you know, it's Linda's idea. And on many occasions, I came this close to saying, why, why am I putting up with all of this? Why don't I just quit? Why don't I just go find a job washing dishes and get this out of my hair? You know, I can't stand this. I, I would come home and a uh, couple of occasions, I never let them see me cry, but a couple of occasions I would c come home and I would cry. I said, I can't stand this. Why do they treat me this way? And then the next morning I would get up and I would say, to hell with them. They're not gonna back me out. They're not gonna make me give up. And I would come in for another day of whatever was in store for me. And then I built a uh, sort of like a shell, a shell that said, I don't care. If I think I'm doing the job, if my membership that I represent thinks I'm doing the job, uh, you know, a pox on your house. And if you don't like my ideas, great. I like them and my membership likes them. If you don't like my opinion, I don't care. 
So for a long time, that is the attitude that I had to take. Thankfully, once I got here and began to work on the issues of diversity and inclusion and more women and, and more people of color in the labor movement and, and looking to build partnerships, it isn't just about saying, okay, here you go, Maldiv, here's a $10,000 donation, goodbye. And or the NAACP or the whatever organization we would give donations, that's all we would do, just give them the money, they would go and that, that would be it. It's about building a real partnership. It's about attending to the needs of that organization and ours. It's about making sure that we get on each other's right side. It's about cultivating a type of relationship that we care about what they're doing and they care about what we're doing because most of the time it's about the same issues. It's about housing. It's about good jobs. It's about good health care. It's about not privatizing social security that affects all people, but mostly it affects people of color by a disproportionate amount. That is the only pension plan that they have. They don't have jobs that give them a uh, fully qualified pension plan. Social security is all that they have, so we fight to protect that when most of our members already have a pension plan. So why are we fighting for social security? Because it affects a lot more people. So those are the kind of issues that I've had to do. And uh, the tough part was the first uh, 25 years of, of my life in the labor movement. The last 10, 11 uh, have been great and I've enjoyed it. Uh, and, but I don't ever want to go back to, uh, <laughs> to 35 years ago.